Kings of America, the capitalist nation. This is a really good one tonight, if I don't mess it up. So <clears throat> here's what we've looked at before. I'm not going to go over the, the mythology stuff. I think you've got it now. Is this the sixth, sixth lecture? We looked at the native nation. That lecture is online. Uh, if you just go to this website, there's a link. Uh, the religious nation is online. <coughs> Then we talked about the immigrant nation and the destined nation and the self-reliant nation. By the way, we had a fantastic discussion of American beauty on Thursday night. Absolutely. All right, let's understand capitalism before we talk about the capitalist mythology and the capitalist identity as a nation uh, because it's usually misunderstood. Uh, Actually, socialism and communism are probably more misunderstood. But let's just have this foundation here. It's actually a little complicated, capitalism, but so I've tried to distill it into uh, the essential aspects, especially those that apply to mythology and identity. The first place to start is that every capitalist system is founded upon inequality. It's founded upon it. It romances inequality. It generates inequality. If it's working, there's inequality. You, at the most basic level of capitalism is inequality. Labor is not supposed to be equal to property owners. That's the whole point of the system. Um, so as you see here, capitalism is based on the ownership of property we're going to come back to that. That's crucial. But not just property, the means of production. That is physical capital, natural resources, and labor. <coughs> you may remember in Gods and Monsters when we talked about Thomas Hobbes and the birth of the state, the notion of the state. This was crucial, especially to John Locke's theory. Private property. It's also crucial to capitalism. Inequality and property ownership. If you don't have those things, you don't have capitalism. All right? So it's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, so because a capitalist owns the property and the means of production, that's a Marxian term you should know, means of production, he doesn't have to perform labor. Right? So now, it's not this, I mean, he has to invest, he has to risk loss, sure. But he doesn't have to work. You buy the work. That's you and me, usually. Right? <clears throat> so ownership equals revenue equals the profit motive. Right? So these things go together, too. If you own the, the property, and if you own the means of production, then you're looking for revenue, and not just revenue. You're looking for profit. You're looking to make more than you spend. All right? Again, built into the system, not an accident, not an extra feature. If you're not making profit, you're dead. Okay? Here's some other things required for a capitalist system private property, like I said, freedom of choice. If there's no freedom <coughs> for consumers to choose your goods, then the capitalist system won't work. It must be self-interested. So again, this is a feature, not a bug. I give you Gordon Gecko and Wall Street. Greed is good. Greed makes, I forget what he says, but you remember. Um, greed is a feature of the system. The system runs on greed are self-interested. And because uh, it's non-communal, there's another way to put that, it's individualistic with greed, uh, it's about competition. So once you accept that it's about revenue and profit, then it naturally follows that it's also about self-interest and competition, because everybody's going to be self-interested. And so now you have a system of competition, but you need efficient and fair markets in order for this to work. What are we talking about? We're talking about access to information, especially. 
that's why insider trading is such a, well, <laughs> theoretically, a bad crime, is because you've, you're gaming the system, you're wrecking the system. Everybody's supposed to have access to the same information um, and to the same markets. Of course, you know, we, we know that's not true. You know that Congress is able to buy stock before we are. And they know what's happening before we do, right? So uh, we'll get to this, but America is not a capitalist nation. Never was. But we have a capitalist mythology. <clears throat> so the other piece is limited government. Does this sound familiar? Why? Because the market is everything. And if you mess with the market, the laissez-faire, uh, free hand of the market, then you're wrecking the system, just like if you have insider information. There must be no government interference in a capitalist system. It's all market. Any questions about that? Because, you know, I don't think a lot of people actually know that. And it's, it's kind of, yeah. Promote the general welfare? Promote the general welfare. That's socialism. No, yeah, it is. But I mean, there are there are. Uh, it's a blend. There are responsibilities that are written out for the citizens of America for the government. You know, trade, that exactly. Warfare, borders, That's why we're not a capitalist nation, nor we have ever have been. There's no social contract. Exactly. Exactly. There's no social contract here. There's no social anything. Exactly. Right. Right. Except that's socialism because it's the redistribution of wealth for the general welfare. That's socialism. So again, if you're in a capitalist system, there is, there, technically there's no government, but I mean, we don't have to go that far. There could be a government for defense of the market, right? But not much more. Okay. At, at this stage of your, your presentation, your argument, you're simply comparing ideals. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not talking about, as I said, this isn't in practice anywhere, nor has it been. I don't. So it's sort of like the argument about socialism that there's never been a socialist country either. A socialist government is never a pure socialist or communist. Well, socialist has, uh, but not communist. Okay. There's, no, there's never been a communist government. Purely communist government. Oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> uh, Brahmavid, then Charlie, then Dean. You're saying our government and capitalism are two distinct things. I'm saying America is socialist. I'm not making any bones about that. America is socialist because we have a government that redistributes wealth through Social Security, Medicare, uh, to the defense. Department, uh, we the government takes in money and it distributes money to for the quote unquote general welfare. Is that? Well, we have a contaminated notion of socialism. Oh, that's the problem, isn't it? Yes. Okay, right, right. Okay, right. You're thinking of Bernie Sanders, aren't you? Yeah. Well, uh, it could be that. Or extremes, extremes. I just yeah. Think Okay, well, I'm giving you extremes. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Capitalism, communism, two extremes that have never been realized, right? Um, most of the world's economies and our economy is socialistic. All right, good, good. So capitalism's over here. Is that on your right side? Yeah, it should be on your right side. See, that's a joke. Okay. <laughs> Pure capitalism is way over here, it looks like that. Pure communism is way over here, it means everybody owns everything. Socialism is a mix and usually involves the government. Pure communism should not involve a government, at least as we know governments. Pure communism should be communal, as Jesus and the disciples did, uh, or sorry, Jesus was gone. Uh, but the disciples did in the book of Acts. They shared everything together. That makes sense?
Okay, because none of that matters. <laughs> because what we live by is the myth of capitalism. It's a way of doing business that became a way of being, an identity and a myth. And you know it. We all live it in one way or another. Again, a myth is a story that shapes our behaviors and actions and beliefs. The myth of capitalism is inevitable given that we have the chosen nation, the religious nation, nature's nation, and manifest destiny. In the myth of capitalism, the market is God. Let me say that again. In the myth of capitalism, the deity is the market. Stop and think about it. Listen to the rhetoric, rhetoric surrounding markets. Well, I, I don't understand, but the market self-corrects. The market does what it does. The market determined the winners and losers. The market's an Old Testament God. I, I'm not being flippant about that. I'm being very serious about that. The market serves the exact same functions as the Hebrew deity as depicted in the Old Testament. It's inscrutable. You don't know why things happen. They just happen. Maybe you have insider information. Maybe you know a few priests on Wall Street. But still, the market can crush you, and you don't know why. You can become Job in the market. The market can bless you, and you don't know why. You can be Abraham in the market. And God just taps you on the shoulder one day and says, hey, you bought that Apple stock in 1986? Congratulations. <clears throat> Harvey Cox is a theologian, <coughs> excuse me, and he noticed this in the uh, 90s in an article for the Atlantic. Let me read you what he said. Uh, Harvard theologian. The lexicon of the Wall Street Journal and the business sections of Time and Newsweek <coughs> turned out to bear a striking resemblance to Genesis, the epistle to the Romans, and St. Augustine's City of God. <coughs> Behind descriptions of market reforms, monetary policy, and the convuls convolutions of the Tao, I gradually made out the pieces of a grand narrative about the inner meaning of human history, why things had gone wrong, <coughs> and how to put them right. Theologians call these myths of origin, legends of the fall, and doctrines of sin and redemption. But here they were again, and in only thin disguise, chronicles about the creation of wealth, the seductive temptations of statism, captivity to the faceless economic cycles, and ultimately salvation through the advent of free markets with a small dose of ascetic belt tightening along the way. Read the news tonight. I don't know what's in it, but I can tell you that's in it. How does capitalism relate to nature's nation? Remember, nature's nation is, is that of the founders who were mostly deists. Uh, they were certainly children of the Enlightenment, and they were looking not for the book of the Bible to determine what to do, but for the, they were looking to the book of nature. So it's nature's nation. Capitalism is self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident. This is Richard Hughes. I've quoted him before. He has a book called Myths America Lives By. The myth of nature's nation probably did more to legitimate American capitalism than any other single factor. So we can't blame religion for this one. This is an enlightenment project, nature's nation, that turns into the capitalist <coughs> mythology. I love these quotations. I'm going to read you some quotations tonight just because I want you to hear these voices because they echo down through the centuries. William Lawrence, Episcopal Bishop of Massachusetts, 1901. And those of you who know your history know that 
late 19th century, early 20th century, really interesting time for America. This is uh, a priest, a bishop. The search for material wealth is therefore as natural, there's that word, as natural and necessary to the man as is the pushing out of its roots for more moisture and food is to the oak. The search for material well-being, safety, security, no, wealth. Charles Conant from the State Department, 1900, seeking new outlets for American capital and new opportunities for American enterprise is a natural law of economic development. American enterprise is a natural law? You see what he did there? It's genius. He took a particular and made it a general. Remember Roland Barthes, our friend from France? Myth transforms history into nature. Capitalism and the chosen nation. Interesting, this pivots on the Civil War. So <clears throat> both sides invoke God's favor in the Civil War, as one does. The North's victory meant, that, meant cities, factories, and wealth. In fact, that was part of the South's issue, part, a small part. Um, is about economic development, of course, when you have free labor. Uh, the North victory means cities, factories, and wealth, and that's what happened. The South's loss means grinding poverty for a century or more. The North interprets its victory and wealth, victory and wealth, as God's approval. The South does the same thing, but it creates a new mythology in the process called the lost cause. Now, I've mentioned this a few times. It's absolutely fascinating. It's basically based on Greek tragedy that the hero always falls. And yes, the South lost, but they own honor. The honor will always fall. I'm telling you, this, that's why there are so many Confederate statues around the country. Those weren't made during the Civil War or immediately after. They were made around this time because the myth of the lost cause was being developed. So you didn't really lose. You lost on the battlefield, but in terms of honor and nobility, you won. And that's where you get this rhetoric about Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and all these people. They were men of honor. Okay. Not incidentally, individual fortunes start to appear in the North. J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Stanford, who, who started in New York but ended in California, Huntington. These are the barons of the Gilded Age. That's a term you may know from Mark Twain, depicting the avarice and shallowness of this time, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, meaning it's gilded, meaning that it's gold, but you can just scratch it and it comes off. Right? Interestingly, during this period, 1861 to 1900, 13 and a half million immigrants arrived to work in the northern factories. Capitalism is built on inequality. You have a cheap, almost free labor force pouring into you in your industrial revolution. Perfect, right? Almost as good as slavery because the people are there willingly. That's messed up, right? Capitalism. The cheaper you get your labor, the more profit you get. This is very simple. And if you're working right now, you probably know that very intimately. Uh, all right, so here we go, Dean. We've got n national wealth. So we've got this national economy now that's burgeoning and expansion into Cuba and by way of Cuba, the Philippines, and, and just like, and like uh, the, the State Department guy said, America's expansion is natural. 
It's just natural. So there it is again, Dean. It's just like, this is obvious. We have to do this. Just a step to say, if national wealth equals God's favor, personal wealth must equal God's favor too, right? <clears throat> and so is born the gospel of wealth. I almost want to say this will sound extreme, but I don't think it sounds extreme anymore. So wealth equals righteousness, poverty equals sin. You heard this? Again, this is not affectation. This is a myth to live by, individually and nationally. Listen to uh, Reverend William Lawrence. He's our old friend, the bishop. Uh, 1901. A reverend. In the long run, it is only to the man of morality that wealth comes. Put two men in adjoining fields, one man strong and normal, the other weak and listless. One picks up his spade, turns over the earth, and works until sunset. The other turns over a few clods, gets a drink from the spring, takes a nap, and loafs back to work. In a few years, one will be rich for his needs, the other a pauper dependent upon the first and growling at his prosperity. Just look at the moves there, man. Just incredible rhetorical moves. Put 10,000, so now we're going from one to everyone. Put 10,000 immoral men to live and work in one fertile valley and 10,000 moral men to live and work <laughs> in the next valley. And the question is soon answered as to who wins the material wealth. Godliness is in league with riches. Now, we don't say it that boldly today. We're getting closer every day, but it's there. Godliness is in league with riches. Okay. Uh, Russell Conwell, whose name is perfect <laughs> for what he's selling, Conwell, this was another minister, a sermon delivered some 5,000 times, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> and reissued in print regularly. Sorry, when is this? Uh, Acres of Diamonds, the sermon, 1890, right in the middle of the Gilded Age. I say that you ought to get rich. It is your duty to get rich. How many of my pious brethren say to me, do you, a Christian minister, spend your time going up and down the country advising young people to get rich, to get money? Yes, of course I do. They say, isn't that awful? Why don't you preach the gospel instead of preaching about man's making money? You know where he's going with this, right? Because to make money is to preach the gospel. That is the reason. The men who get rich may be the most honest men <laughs> you find in the community. Here's our friend, Henry Ward Beecher. So then, now this is, this is a man, this is an opinion maker. This is not some rural guy. He's, he was like a public intellectual of the time, uh, 19th century, late 19th century. So then, I am not afraid to rejoice. Get rich if you can. And when you have amassed wealth, it will be God's power, if you are wise to use it, by which you can make your home happier, the community more refined, and the whole and more civilized. And on the whole, the general tendency of wealth is such as to lead me today to thank God for increasing the wealth of America. May it ever be sanctified. May it ever learn nobler uses and aspire higher and higher because that's part of it too, right? You get to do noble things when you're noble by way of wealth. Until the symbolism of the heavenly state where the very streets are paved with gold shall be reproduced in the realities and actualities of our life here on earth. The general truth will stand that no man in this land suffers from poverty what? What's he going to say? Unless it be more than his fault. Unless it be his sin. If you are poor, you have sinned. You're not unlucky. You're a sinner because you're poor. 
Not in spite of it, because you're poor. That is what made you a sinner. I just thought you should hear Jesus, <laughs> just, you know, so you can see how this myth has, has stolen language and it's to the point where it's unrecognizable. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? A rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich, not someone who loves money, not someone who is greedy, but someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Mark 10, Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, <coughs> there your heart will be also. And even St. Paul, not the most uh, forward-thinking of the writers of the New Testament, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and their ego eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. That's what you can do with a myth. You can completely flip it. As we experience today, if you're a Christian, uh, as so-called in the public sphere, uh, the public square, uh, which is now social media. Uh, what, do you, what do you believe? You believe you should be wealthy. You believe that other people who aren't wealthy are getting what they deserve. Into this toxic brew, we now introduce social Darwinism. OK, so Darwin's Origin of Species, 1859, uh, where he talked about natural selection. One of the founders of the discipline of sociology, Herbert Spencer, took that and mythologized it right, into something called survival of the fittest. Any scientists, especially biologists here, want to correct me. I don't believe Darwin used the term survival of the fittest. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe he used the term natural selection. But notice the difference in the phrases. Right? One is fairly benign. Not to say there's not a brutal reality behind it, but survival of the fittest. That's good mythological language, right? We like that. Herbert Spencer took this and said, stole the language. Myth is stolen language. He stole the language and said, ah, well, you see, there are bound to be people who do not survive. Okay. One of his favorite disciples was Andrew Carnegie who in 1889 wrote an article for, um, I forget what it was for, but it was called Wealth. That's just the title. And he says, America is about the survival of the economically fittest. Based on the law of competition, Darwin, slightly repurposed, also capitalism, the law of competition, the conflation of nature's nation, the chosen nation, and the millennial nation comes together in capitalism and it comes together in social Darwinism. Social Darwinism. I mean, that's an incredible leap, right? You're going to go from the natural world and genetics and millions of years of evolution to what happened in the last decade to poor people or to rich people? It's a completely illegitimate uh, approach. But mythology is not the logical it's the mythological. So if you tell a good story, especially a story that reinforces where you are and what you believe, because mythology does that, they can also challenge that story, but it also reinforces it. Hey, we got a good story. Um, Carnegie said, recognition of and obedience to these principles will solve the problem of the rich and for poor and bring peach on earth. So be a lot of peaches, apparently. Sorry. Um, but looks, look at what has happened here. It's 
brilliant in its brutality. The rich are doubly chosen. The rich are chosen by God, and then they are chosen by nature, by, by the survival of the fittest. It's a, it's a merging of religion and science. The one we've been looking for, and we find it in capitalism. Likewise, the poor are doubly cursed by nature and by God. Dude, you don't have a chance if you're cursed by nature and by, by God, and you can't fail if you're blessed by nature and by God. Now, I don't, I don't mean to, to discredit philanthropy. I think these people, many of these people gave for good reasons um, to try to better the world, but they were able to better the world because they benefited from the mythology that, that left behind the people they were trying to help. Again, I don't want to belittle philanthropy. I'm all for philanthropy, but notice the nature of the philanthropy. If you're in a college or a university, what do you get if you give? You get a building. You get a monument. So you apologize yourself. Exactly. Exactly. The Henry and Odell uh, Shackelford Auditorium for the Arts. Dude, that's, a, that's like... I don't mean to call it a scam, but it, it's every college and university does that except us, because we don't have any money. <laughs> we'll take it, but we're not going to name a building after you for your money. We don't have that many buildings. Anyway, the point is, it's monumentalizing. Heide Heidegger has a great piece on this uh, about the nature of monuments as an attempt to stop time. So you're absolutely right. It's monumental. The giving is monumental. It's branding. In fact, there are corporate offices for this very thing. Again, not saying it doesn't do anything good. I'm saying it's part of the same mythology. Really important sociologist, by the way. All right, let's, let's keep moving. Um, OK, capitalism and manifest destiny. I think you probably saw this coming all along. We even mentioned it early on. This is, again, Reverend Josiah Strong in a book called Our Country, 1885. It's, again, I just want you to hear these voices. Uh, they're amazing to me. Like, I just kept rereading them. It seems to me that God, with infinite wisdom and skill, is training the Anglo-Saxon race. I know. <laughs> white man's burden, who said that? Yes. I was going to say, Rudyard Kipling, white man's burden. Uh, read that poem about noblesse oblige, or, or really racial oblige. By the way, <clears throat> they tend to use the term race to mean nation back then. So I'm not sure what he might mean nation. I don't know. Uh, training the Anglo-Saxon race for an hour sure to come in the world's future. Heretofore, there has always been in the history of the world a comparative, comparatively unoccupied land westward, westward into which the crowded countries of the east have poured their surplus population. But the widening waves of migration which millenniums ago rolled east and west into the valley of the Euphrates, met today on our Pacific coast. See what he's doing? Myth of stolen language. There are no more new worlds. The unoccupied arable lands of the earth are limited and will soon be taken. He was right. The time is coming when the pressure of population on the means of subsistence will be felt here, as it is now felt in Europe and Asia, then will the world enter upon a new stage of its history, the final competition of the races. I know. <laughs> For which the Anglo-Saxon Saxon is being schooled. Uh, you see why I didn't have a separate lecture on white supremacy? <laughs> it's just like all through everything. Long before the thousand millions are here, the mighty centrifugal tendency inherent in this stock and strengthened in the United States will assert itself. Then this race of unequaled energy with all the majesty of numbers and the might of wealth behind it, the representative, let us hope, of the largest liberty. Now, listen to this. I love this. The largest liberty, the purest Christianity, the highest civilization, having developed peculiarly aggressive traits calculated to impress its institutions upon mankind, will spread itself over the earth. 
If I read not amiss, this powerful race will move down upon Mexico, down upon Central and South America, and out upon the islands of the sea, over upon Africa and beyond. And can anyone doubt that the result of this competition of races will be the survival of the fittest? Amen. So, manifest destiny, almost inevitable. Given the chosen nation, given the nature's nation, given uh, the religious nation, moves into global. Remember, manifest destiny was really about reaching the western, completing the continental right span, reaching the other ocean. Now it means reaching all the other oceans. Uh, Spanish-American War, 1898. You may know about this. This is really the kind of high point or perhaps low point of uh, manifest destiny. Anyway, I want to move through this quickly. Basically, what happens is with manifest destiny, you see there's an inherent problem here in that you're America. So you're about equal rights for everybody. right? So how are you supposed to justify manifest destiny? How are you supposed to justify capitalism and social Darwinism? It goes against your creed, unless we're talking about the economic part of the nation. Hey, it's not the government. It's our economy. We didn't make any promises about our economy. So onward. Now, remember, all along, there's never one, <laughs> one story. There's never one story in America that may be the defining feature of America, the identity of America. There's never one story. There's never one myth. So there are critiques of the capitalist nation 1886 was a crucial year for that. There, were, there was a general strike. 350,000 workers shut down the entire country. Think about that. What did they want? An eight-hour workday. Almost everything you take for granted in your job was won by labor in the late 19th century and early 20th century. No wonder capitalist people hate labor. You have to if you're a capitalist, because labor is a, must be cheap. And when you demand more than the minimum I pay you, I cannot accept uh, that. Yeah. Haymarket bombing in Chicago. Um, not, we're not sure what exactly happened, but it was a big labor protest. The bomb went off. People went to jail. It, it kind of signaled the nadir of, not the nadir, but uh, a dark moment in that history. But it also sparked more strike. There were 1,400 strikes that year, 1886. Later that year, um, or later in following years, there were millions of workers and thousands of strikes. Think about that. In America, that history gets lost in the telling. Their point, capitalism is not natural. It is cultural. If it's cultural, you can change it. You're not bound to it. Pretty simple uh, point. And of course, uh, well, I threw this in here because you know about this, right? The corporate personhood, uh, that corporations are legally considered people in some ways. Do you, do you know where that comes in? That comes in under the 14th Amendment, guaranteeing people of all races um, their constitutional rights. Put corporations in there. Right? Um, remember, there's always difference. There's also the social gospel in Catholicism, the Knights of Labor. Um, Dorothy Day, that's her there, wrote a book called The Long Loneliness, which is fantastic. Uh, started the Catholic worker movement. Protestantism, we have uh, Rauschenbusch, Rauschenbusch, 1897, massive efforts to be Christian, I would say, if we're going to go by what Jesus said, to shelter the homeless, to feed the hungry, to take care of the poor. Charles Sheldon, 1897, uh, appears with his novel In His Steps and coins the phrase, what would Jesus do? You remember that? That was very popular. Remember the bracelets? What would Jesus do? And then, of course, we have to satirize that and say, what would whatever do. Interesting critiques of the capitalist nation from African Americans. 
especially uh, Lucy Parsons, uh, wife of Albert, who was killed in that Haymarket bombing in Chicago, founder of a newspaper called Freedom. Let me let you hear her. That's her right there. This is a speech to, <laughs> I want to say it was a, an anarchist conference, but, and I'm not trying to be funny. You know, the anarchists, how do you have a meeting if you're an anarchist? Uh, do you wonder why there are anarchists in this country, in this great land of liberty, as you love to call it? Go to New York. Go through the byways and alleys of that great city. Count the myriad starving. Count the multiplied thousands who are homeless. Number those who work harder than slaves and live on less and have fewer comfort than the meanest slaves. You will be dumbfounded by your discoveries. You who have paid no attention to these poor, save as objects of charity and commiseration. Um, they are not objects of charity. They are victims of the rank injustice that permeates the system of government and a political economy that holds sway from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It is oppression. The misery it causes, the wretchedness it gives birth to, are found to a greater extent in New York than elsewhere. But we love the rich as our symbol, don't we? This is uh, Siri Hustevelt, who is an artist. I think this is, yeah, this is a book called The Blazing World. Of course we need the rich. We always have to ogle and envy and imitate. They are our spectacle and our joy, because in the head of every American lies the thought, that could be me. The rich constitute our mythos, after all, our fairy tale, our hymn to success. Capitalism as a mythological force affects you and me. Everything from choosing your major my God, how many conversations with parents have I had where they say, well, what's he going to do with the philosophy degree? Become wise? <laughs> no, I mean, what kind of job is he going to get? Oh, he's not going to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Moving to a new place. Maxine Hong Kingston in her marvelous memoir. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Memoirs of a Girlhood. Among us, the woman warrior. I uh, encourage you to read that. She's a second generation Chinese America, American, and she comes over and, and she's trying to figure out how these old stories of China exist in the Bay Area. And she says, Oh, I get it. Back home, it was about the land. Now, my job is my land. Think about the people who've lived on this planet. The large majority of them have been informed. Their identities have been shaped in part, in large part, by the land on which they lived. Maxine Hong Kingston says, my job is my land. What will make you move across the country to a city you don't like? What will make you move at all? Your job. Your job runs your life. Most of us. Ethical decision making. Right? I don't need to tell you all this. Uh, the promise of a personal golden age, right? Oh, we know this. I mean, even if we try to deny it, we know this. Of course, conspicuous consumption, Thorsten Veblen's phrase, and of course, voting for president. I, um, I, I was young when Reagan was running for president, and I bought it. He said, the only question you have to ask is, are you better off now than you were were four years ago. And I thought, yeah, that's it, right? Isn't that it? That's so obvious. It's so self-evident. And I waited for years for someone to correct that. And it was Barack Obama in 2008 who said, that's not the question. The question is, is the country better off today? That difference is all the difference in the world. The capitalist nation. It's a remarkable fusing of the chosen nation, the religious nation, uh, nature's nation, and manifest destiny. I don't know if there's anything like this in the world that's ever happened. Um, and it could only happen in America. It's fused by need, greed, and pride. Think about that. Need, greed, and pride. So it's nothing to be ashamed of. On the contrary, it's something to be proud of, that you're wealthy. 
I think it's the most active and profound myth in America right now. Let's hear what you think. 